morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to our Deeper Look series. I'm Brandon Holdy, I'm the artistic producer here. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. So, um, we're very excited to dive into what I refer to as um, how we approached a new, a new brain. So, um, I'll have the panelists introduce themselves and we'll do a little uh, preface to all of this. Associate artist. Joe Calarco, director of A New Brain and associate artist at Barron's and Sage Company. Uh, Vadim Fechner, musical director, associate artist, Barrington Theatre Company. Barrington Theatre Company? What do they call it? What is it? Barrington Stage Company. Oh, geez. <laughs> what show number is this being? 20. Great. I am Chloe Davis. I'm the choreographer for New Brain, and this is my debut season. So, how many of you have seen? Another a new brain before. A couple people, three people. Excellent. Who has seen our a new brain? Great. So it's um, it's not a huge canonical show. It's not like West Side Story. So I feel like now that there's huge spoilers in a new brain, uh, but we will try not to talk too much about the shows in great specifics to ruin any moments for you. But uh, Joe, do you want to talk a little bit about? or Vadim, the history of a new brain before it got to us. Kind of like the, the Cliff's Notes version of the last 25 years. Um, it's, it started as Bill writing a series of songs, uh, semi-autobiographical, and it was first presented just an evening at the public theater as a song cycle. Then he reached out to Grazia Danielle, the director, to say, I want you to direct this. She said it shouldn't be a song cycle, and she said, call James Levine, because you need him to help fashion the book. And then it was done at Lincoln Center in 1998, where I first saw it. Um, and then Encores, it was done at Encores in 2015, with some changes. And then here we are with more changes. So no one has seen this a new brain ever, this version. Let's just say it's based on a mostly true experiences of Bill's life. Gordon Schwinn, the musical theater writer, is Bill Finn, the musical theater writer. Um, it's very much based on what happened to him when he went to hospital in the mid '90s. Um, so it was a show that is beloved by theater people. We love a new brain. And it was after 1998, it was done quite a bit. Never got like that huge regional production because it was an off-Broadway show and it's in a lot of smaller theaters. Um, and then what happened this year is with our new artistic director, Alan Paul, came on board. Uh, he and I were talking about what shows to do in his first season. And we had landed on Cabaret as his show that he was going to direct to kick off the season. And then he said, well, I want to meet Bill Finn. I feel like I need to meet Bill Finn. I was like, you really should meet Bill Finn. And he said, I feel like we should do a Bill Finn show. Uh, we narrowed down the list, and then he went to go have the short, short, short version of it. He went to go have dinner with Bill. He said, Bill, I was thinking I'd like to do one of your shows, one of these shows. What do you think? Bill said nothing. And he just thought, like, oh, oops. Um, and then as Alan was leaving, Bill goes, I want you to do a new brain. Um, and when Alan came back to the office, those of us on the team were so excited because it's such a beloved show. But we knew that um, a new brain as it was on paper, uh, needed some love. Um, because it came out of being a song cycle, um, it flows sometimes like a song cycle. So when looking for a director, uh, we realized that Joe would be the perfect person. Um, because not only we know his work so well and he's so brilliant, but he's also a writer and a dramaturg. And we knew that Joe would be able to sit down and start figuring out some of the pieces of the puzzle that were missing maybe puzzle pieces that were there. So Joe, talk a little bit about how you approach figuring out the trajectory, the storyline of A New Brain and how to tell that story with what, with what you were given initially. Um, the great thing about Bill's shows as a director, an entire creative team, is um, First of all, they're very daring. He doesn't sound like anybody else, musically or lyrically. And, um, but he, 
he lyrically he writes the way people interact with each other, so he doesn't lay a lot of exposition on you. So it's responsibility in staging it to, to help tell the story. And the script we got, which was, it wasn't even accurate to what was in an encore, because it was their first rehearsal script, which then changed in rehearsal. Um, and there were virtually no stage directions, which I like, because it's like, what is our production ever going to be? Um, and so for me it was about when, what is real in the show, what is reality, what is his reality distorted um, by uh, surrealism moments and visitations that happen in his brain, and then when were we literally in his brain, um, and in non-reality. So that was, that's the first thing I did, was to f try to follow that. and. Um, and I mean, it's a very, uh, I mean, the story itself is, is rather simple and beautiful, um, but it was complicated to try to figure out how to tell it visually. We actually made a massive change, and it depends when you saw the show, because if you saw the show before, what day was today? Thursday. Thursday was the big change. No, it was Friday. Friday was the big change. So if you saw it before Friday, you have to see it again, because you will see a quite a different show, um, certainly in the beginning. Um, uh, so yeah, it was just, it's just that, and then you get in the room with, uh, I mean, Chloe and I, I've known the Dean for a long, long time, so we started talking right away of like, and you should talk, because he has known Bill, I mean, I've known Bill for like 17 years, you've known him much longer, but, um, and just me asking questions like, Okay, which version of this song, <laughs> um, or what is accurate? And then we ended up, this is the, the greatest thing is, you know, I've known Bill for a long time, and I was so touched that he wanted me to do it, and, and I said, you know, do we have freedom to sort of go between the two versions? Um, and he said yes, and then I reached out to James with some very specific questions that I had about moments, and he said, Joe, it's your ball game, like, I'm, we're grateful you're doing it, so basically, we could sort of play. Um, we added a song that was rehearsed for Lincoln Center and never made it to performances. That's one of Bill's most sung songs in cabaret situations. Um, so it's been really, really great. But we started having these conversations, and then um, this is the first time Chloe and I are working together, and it's been an amazing collaboration. And we got in the studio together with some dancers and just started working. So it's really been a what I, one of the things I most love about theater and directing is it's like putting, the, it's like a puzzle. How are you going to put the puzzle together? And Bill's puzzles are complicated <laughs> and abstract at times. And you know, you're not seeing a picture of a horse. <laughs> it's with pieces, it's coming to be moved yeah. around. Sometimes yeah. there are no edge pieces. Yeah. Sometimes a horse is a kitty cat. Uh, Chloe, how do you, so when you join the project, how do, because I know you've worked with, you know, Grazi, that's a Danielle who directed choreographed the original version, and the choreographer of Encore's name just slipped through my brain. Josh Prince. Oh, I knew that. Apologies. Hi, YouTube. Uh, <laughs> later, YouTube. How did you find, the working with Joe, how did you find the visual vocabulary of a show that moves, but never really dances? I don't think Bill Finn musicals ever really, they, they never really dance dance. Well, so how did you find that happy place? I guess it's your definition of what dance is. <laughs> you know, um, First of all, I'm honored to be here. Um, definitely to work with Joe and Vadim, um, and also to uh, do a work by Legend. I think it's excellent. I find it um, maybe serendipitous that Grazi, you know, I've worked with her before. Also, Josh Prince worked with him before, and they both um, are creators of a new brain. And to be able to have that opportunity to do it now, I think is. Great, and you know, um, both of them, I'm sure, are very proud for me to um, have my own idea as to what this is. And what I really love about choreography, because it has an opportunity to tell stories in a way um, where you don't have to speak, um, and it has an opportunity to explore reality as well as um, uh, the imaginative state, which is really important to this production. And so, my approach to a new brain was, I was really just influenced by the music itself. 
I feel that every song is so unique and it's particular because it's also particular to the characters. There's, there's 10 different characters in the show. And so my exploration was um, what, what, is the, what is the creative movement of the music? Like what, what is that extra instrument or that, that extra idea that's in there that maybe wasn't written and how can I uncover that? And I think what's important too when we talk about dance or, or creative movement, I feel like every character is distinct. They have isms, right? Like we all have isms. Our legs are crossed right now. You know, I move my hair, this is an ism. And then like, how do I take those isms or gestural things and put them into this gestural sequence to make movement or to make dance or make it dance? Um, so that was, that was the objective for New Brain where what are, What's the story? What's the feel? What's the mood? Um, what are the isms? What are the gestures? And how can I bring them to life on these characters, but more so the bodies of these actors? So that was my approach. And um, I loved working with Joe. Joe and I worked in like a pre-pro to really find out what those nuances are and like, you know, asking like, what do you think? What, what is the story? And, and sometimes there was this idea that he knew and there's sometimes it wasn't. And it was kind of like, well, what about this? And he's like, okay, I think that's how, and they're off, how we found um, that beautiful vocabulary and storytelling. So yeah, that was my thing of, um, you know, it is kind of difficult sometimes when you do have like a sung through show. Um, I worked on Ain't Misbehaving before, which is similar to this idea of a sung through show and the importance of uh, how do we take movement, not only to help with the isms of the character, but also to tell the history. And I think what's really nice is um, through movement, we also see relationships, like the relationship of uh, boyfriends, relationship of mother and son, relationship of friends, relationship of boss, and you know, how do we find creative movement to dive deeper into that? Can you go a little bit into pre-pro? You know, yes, what, what is pre-pro, right? <laughs> um, so pre-production is, I think, so essential when it, when, you are collaborating on creating a new idea. And pre-production offers you an opportunity to use creatives to individually dive into um, what you think the story should be, find your foundation, your outline, use artists to come in, maybe do a read of songs or, um, or sing of songs, read of, of the script, or even creating movement before you're actually going into your process. So that way you have information before the process starts, especially if you don't have a long process, and process is a rehearsal process. So with me, pre-pro is really important because it gives me an idea of uh, what kind of movement I want to put out, and then it gives me an idea of like how different bodies are able to interpret the movement, and then it gives me an idea to, it gives me, I guess, a foundation to come into a process and say, I have this information for you, so let's begin. But I also, side note, encourage in processes with me where I love having that foundation but also getting to know the actors so that way we can organically create together because I think that's most important. I don't think we should always carbon copy one thing to another. I think what makes theater beautiful because it's alive and being able to have an idea of what you want but then having the, another collaboration, having the artists like really show them who they are but pre-pro is so essential, and so Joe and I um, were both based in New York, and so we, uh, thanks to Barrington, um, they offered us uh, a pre like a couple of three days of pre-production where we had six dancers um, that I had previously worked with that were eager to join us on exploring what movement is, and we had several hours a day where you know we'll put the music on, and it's like, hey, learn some movement, and we started to organically find what the vocabulary of the show looked like, but actually what the vocabulary of each song looked like. And it was just great. Um, this also allowed, pre-production is important, it also allows collaborators an opportunity to see how we work together, which is really essential in creating something from the ground up. You know, it's kind of like we're the parents of this production. It's like a three parents, you know, we're all co-parenting. <laughs> and um, it's really important for us to have um, a system a foundation on how we communicate so that way we can, um, our artists feel comfortable working with us and that we can actually dive into ideas and feel free to explore what we want. Um, 
I want to say one thing about this collaboration too is that um, it's so interesting when you work with new people because it is like um, a new relationship and what we, we met on Zoom <laughs> and but what was great and is Chloe came in to talk about the script like we didn't talk about movement until like the last part of the call which is more about like our um, our feelings about movement and again I would say the same thing that like to me this is what I just did is dance so um, uh, and even like and 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 this relationship with me is always super important with the choreographer because I'm very movement oriented I mean even you know to me there are parts of waiting for Joe last summer which was dance um, which so it's super important to me that I also say I think you should be able to turn off the sound of a production not happily you don't want it but like and still understand the relationships and how they change on stage waiting for Joe is sadness. oh thank you thank you very much um, appreciate that um, but so and I believe that you should not be able to tell where a director and a choreographer's work stops and leads into the other and the great thing about it, and their office because in a way it was like it was there was true collaboration in terms of what we each did in it but it was uh, it, that's super important to me is that um, that our work meshes together and that's the pre-pro is so important too because it really was about how do you communicate but there wasn't you know there was no problem communicating like we we knew on the zoom that we like i had other people to interview afterwards and i was like <laughs> and then someone had to postpone i'm like oh my god i just want to like offer to chloe so can we just like finish this process but um anyway it's been amazing and yeah and if you want to see what chloe's talking about uh a lot of the isms in pre-pro and character work. Two of my favorite moments in the entire show um, had to deal with Mary Testa in And They're Off and in the Leo Cuddyhunk, where you see character and isms really at play in such a beautiful moment that every night it makes me laugh. Um, also, I want that track. Um, so, Vadim, let's talk a little bit about, you've known Bill, worked with Bill for a long time. What was it like? You did not work in the original New Brain. You worked a bit on the in between New Brain. In the encores. Yep, and then what was it like knowing that so many songs have the original version, the new version, the version that this person recorded for that album, the version that, like the eight other verses Bill never put in. Like what was it like, because I know you had a cobble together, quilt together, yes. this version musically. Um, the, the Bill that shows, you know, I, I guess I started working with Bill 1999-ish, when I was in college and he was my teacher. Um, so they're always chaos because like things just get changed and added at every step, uh, like every step. So like we rehearse it and then it changes to get into the theater and then we record it and then we make the final sheet music but every time Bill will say change the, you know, and so like nothing matches, nothing anywhere matches. So the CD is not what we did on stage, which is not what's in the score, which is, so you have, it's, you have to like do encores like work to like actually figure out what the, the actual document is. Um, but like in things like this, I think, you know, they say write like your, write like your parents are dead. I like to do shows as if, you know, the writers are dead, um, which you can't really do, but I like to start there. Um, when we, when we did this, we did this at Encores, and I know that a, a thing that's weird in the theater is like it costs so much to put the music on paper um, and to get someone to write it out, so many times it does not get written out. So we did all these changes in Encores, but it would cost 50 grand to get someone to make a document that said, oh, by the way, this is what you did, and there was no one who was going to do it. We just did like a... Encores, which if you don't know, it's like a 10-day experience. Uh, yeah. uh, but you get in there, it's like you barely learn anyone's names, and then suddenly they're off book doing a show in a 4,000-seat house, um, and it's madness. Uh, and then at the end of it, it's not like, oh, great, let's codify this into the score for future generations to enjoy. Uh, none of that happened. Uh, so once they said New Brain was happening, I'm like, oh my god, how are we going to do that version that doesn't exist. Um, luckily, Encores keeps boxes of stuff around. I'm like, just tell me you have my score. 
Uh, so they found my, you know, six-year-old score that has scribbles and people's names and arrows and pointing and slashes. And I'm like, is this all that exists? Um, that's, that's what we got. So uh, the people back in Manhattan s uh, scanned it all in and we gave this disgusting <laughs> document to all the actors and they have to look and it's kind of humiliating to me, like this, man, how do I keep my book? It looks terrible. Uh, but basically that was the score everyone had to use was my, you know, rough hewn uh, thing. Um, but yeah, then we got in here and then we made the changes on top of it. Um, we built like an opening for the show and then discarded the opening for the show. Um, but the, these shows can take a lot of stuff because they're built, I mean, you alluded to it, they're, they're, they're built on index cards in a weird way. Um, they're very modular, like Bill, when Bill, Bill was sick, he was in the hospital, you know, he's like, give me a keyboard. And so he gets a keyboard and he's, he just starts writing stuff. He's like, I want to write a song about Arthur. So he writes Salem. He goes, look, I want to write a song about, you know, mother coming to help me. And he was in a zone back in the day when he was writing this. And then it's just a matter of saying, oh, this could go here, this could go here, this could go here. Uh, and they literally just put all the songs on index cards. Same as falsettos, if you've ever seen falsettos. It's a, another index card show where he writes big ideas and then move them around. Um, so yeah, when, when, when you approach a show like this, we can kind of do the same thing. Uh, we didn't do a lot of moving, but um, all the ideas are so good and so pure uh, that they're, they're complete in and of themselves, and you could always do that. I have an index card piece of trivia. Supposedly hair was written. Everything was on index cards. They threw them in the air. And the things that ended up face up is what is in the hair. Because they wrote like 150 songs or something. That tracks. That tracks. Makes so, <laughs> so, so, so just for reference point, normally when we do a show here, like when we do Cabaret, we get the license from the licensing house and in comes beautiful scripts and a beautiful score, and a piano conductor score with the music director, and vocal parts for all the actors, and then you learn the show. For this show, we got, actually we got scripts three days ago, uh, I think by accident. What they sent us was every actor was gonna get the piano conductor score, which is massive. Mm -hmm. And then 400 pages. pages. 400 pages. Of just music, and I don't even think some of the lines were in there. <coughs> so uh, I do hope that maybe after this, it gives the licensing house yes. something a little more usable. But normally that's what you do, but this show was, I think, an opportunity to be like, oh, we don't have that. <laughs> the licensing house can't get mad at us for not doing what they sent us, because they didn't really send us anything. Um, which I want to talk, bring this around to putting any time into the show, which is a show song that Joe is alluding to. It's a great built-in <coughs> song, recorded so many times. Um, what was the decision to put that in? I know the three of us had talked about it, um, how to get put in, where was it originally, and like what kind of about, because I think it's kind of a big moment here to put the song back where it kind of belongs, maybe not where it belonged originally. It's not exactly clear history of exactly like when it got cut, how it got cut. Um, it was definitely not in the place that we are, we have it in our production. It, uh, for me, the big thing was um, the relationship between Gordon and Roger. Um, we wanted to, he's written a very rich, um, rich characters, is what Bill does. But I didn't feel like um, Roger uh, had enough, this sounds simplistic to say, enough to say. But it was important to me that that relationship was fully um, well-rounded and that we really saw their love beyond, I knew that in staging and, you know, I had, um, I've known Adam, Adam and Daryl I've worked with in the past and I took them out, both out to dinner before we got here so they could meet before they started the rehearsal and I knew that they would enrich it physically and like literally how we staged it that we would see that loving relationship but it is helpful when it's in text, and it seemed important to me that um, that that be voiced. And I was surprised in a way that the song isn't where it is in this production because it made so much sense to me that 
you know, Gordon is saying, go. <laughs> and uh, Roger's like, no, I'm not going. And I will always be here. And it's interesting because once I, I decided to put it in, and I know Daryl initially was a little nervous, like on the page of like, but once we started to stage it, they both, he was like, now it completely makes sense to me. And, and Adam said, he's like, I, I don't understand without the song of how, that literally we had to reconcile because they're fighting right before it. In one word, which was the last word of the song before, that they sort of reconcile, which again is totally done through the acting, would have to be done through acting and I don't want to say staging, because it's like, it's a one word, it's, it's a monosyllabic word, no. Um, so I'm, I'm super um, happy it's in and I think, it, and you know, it is, there are so many other biographical things in the show and I think one of the most powerful is the relationship between uh, Gordon and Roger, Bill and his partner Arthur, and um, I just showed it on stage, and and again, if, you know, we've all either experienced it or or have seen it from afar, of when illness comes in, of who's going to stay and be there, and I think that's a powerful thing to show on stage. So, yeah, I, I love the thing that we we took two songs that we are now doing not the opposite of what they were meant to do, but it, a different thing that they were meant to do. They're very elastic, like the song that we put in any time. I think kind of clearly in the lyric is written from the, a person who's dead or planning on being dead, kind of. Um, well, let me tell the, me. The song was actually, and this happened with some of Bill's songs. So Bill wrote that, the, his, his song cycle elegy is, the story of any time is, is told in that show, which is a very dear friend of him was dying, and he wrote a song for her as if she was singing to her child. Like a, a little final elegy, like this is what I would want to tell you, and for you to know when I pass away. And then it was said to be put into a new brain back in 98. So the song had already been written, and not for a new brain, but was put into a new brain. Um, so yeah. Yeah, there, there was a version, I think, the, the, one of the versions I read was that Gordon had written a letter to Roger, and then Roger read the letter, and it's basically, I'm going to be here watching over you, I'm everywhere you look, basically. And in our version, it also works as a love song. Um, um, it also, it reconfigures the song before, Go, which in, uh, in its perfect form, like, they get from one place and they end together. Uh, and in our version, they actually are s still fighting a little bit at the end, which uh, necessitates any time. So it's just kind of beautiful that there are two great songs, but now they just have different executions. And this is about collaboration with actors, because I have certainly, Adam and I were in constant communication before we came up here, and so he knew of this idea and what I wanted to do, and, and I had said to him, we cannot have them reconcile in Just Go. And so the very first time we rehearsed it, he played it that way, and I, and, and I was like, because I was worried when I, when I put it in and I read through it on the page, I was like, oh my God, I don't, maybe it doesn't work. Maybe we're just repeating the moments. But then again, you have an actor who I've said, this is what needs to happen, and he came in and played it that way, and I'm like, it completely works. Like the first time we did it, that I staged that scene, it's like, a, it's like they have a little bit of a one-act play in the middle of it of the piece to show the relationship. And I was so relieved, and again, that is, because Chloe's, you know, talked about this too, the collaboration with actors is huge, and we both, all three of us, in the past day and a half have said, have said this show is yours. Like, you eventually give it away. It's, the beginning as a director, what's interesting is you feel like, and creative team, you feel like you know more about the show than, because you have to know more about the show than anybody. But as you go and go and go, they what they bring to it and what they and they're living in it, and they're creating these characters that they it's just they take it away from you in the best ways, and um, it's beyond what you ever thought it could be in terms of the nuances. And this cast is so extraordinary, and so I always say like my goal as a director is to create like a frame of the show, and then the actors can sort of run around in it, and they know sort of where the parameters are. And this cast, I mean, every single performance of every song 
is nuanced differently every night because they, they're they smart and they're brilliant and, um, I mean, all of them certainly, you know, literally throw them out and um, the music still plays on that Mary Tessa does both are completely different emotionally every single performance. But true to it, and she understands the character, and she obviously has the longest relationship of anybody um, here with Bill. So she's done them since she was 19, so. Every night with Mary, like, and I was like, like uh, you know, sometimes I go in the white room in a show, not now, because it's too early. Uh, but like, just watch, like, like I, she demands to be watched, and every night it's different. And so there's always just new stimuli for me to, to deal with. And it's like, oh, let, let's go here with her. And she's always changing and uh, shape-shifting. And like, it's astonishing. One thing I do want to say, and I think that we like all leaned into, the writing was there, but like the wit, the sarcasm, the comedy of the show, I think was really, really leaned into through, you know, whether it's vocal arrangements, crash bang, you know, whether it's, you know, the staging or even the choreography. I think it's really important um, that we come to the theater to feel and we can all use some laughter. So like really cultivating and leaning into the humor of life, even in such a detrimental time. So I think leaning into, into that humor was a beautiful um, tactic we used for this production. Um, because also that means when it was time for those heartfelt moments, then we really grabbed you because it's unexpected and you were with us for so long because you trust us, because you're laughing. And then finally, when we show you the truism of the situation, then it hits home more. So I, I do have to commend us for leaning into the realism of life, but also um, leaning on humor and wit and sarcasm um, to also show the other side. So yeah, I do want to talk about that. And that's Bill. I mean. The, you know, it's uh, his, he can be sarcastic and he can be very brittle and it can be intimidating at times, but I've, in his writing certainly, but for me personally, like, his heart is so big. I mean, he's been so supportive of me in the past 17 years. And so those two things pushing against each other is what makes his piece, his work unique. This also has to do with casting. Like I always say, at least 60% of direction is casting. Like you better cast it right. And with Bill shows, you really have to cast it right because they have to understand that those two things have to coexist. That this open heart, but with Bill's sense of humor and how he sees life um, is slightly off center. Um, and that's again what's brilliant about this work. Talk about casting a bit. Because um, you had to tackle the same thing with Ragtime you did here. There's some iconic performances in the original Ragtime that you find new voices for. Uh, how'd you approach that for a new brain? Especially when one of the iconic performances for a new brain was Mary Testa as Lisa the homeless woman. Um, how did you go about kind of casting, for those of us who've listened to this cast album since 1999, over and over and over again, how do you kind of approach that? Because you did so brilliant both with Ragtime and now with New Brain. How do you go into this being like, honor Bill's work, but because we had a lot of people come in who were giving us Kristen Chenoweth, because Kristen Chenoweth was the original thin nurse. And we had a lot of Kristen Chenoweth knockoffs coming in. And I could tell the look on both their faces, like the moment someone started, it's like, oh, here comes Kristen Chenoweth. Um, well, so how do you do approach that to, to find the heart of Bill's piece while trying to shut out that beautiful, beautiful cast album. Um, well, Mary was the first person cast because I just was like, the full circle of it, her relationship with Bill, and knowing she would kill that part, and I think, honestly, at times, um, it, was, it, was, it was exciting for me to, for her to see her play a role that's like, so well-rounded, which she obviously has played, but sometimes, you know, Mary goes on comes on, does a killer number, and leaves, and has a great night. Um, but to see her really um, be able to like show the range of her talent, which is so massive, um, was exciting to me. And then, again, Adam I've worked with and known, and we just were like, he's the perfect, again, there are certain Bill Finn actors um, that there's something quirky about them. Um, 
Italian demand. Italian demand who built in actors. They've worked with them before. We worked with them, so those were cast. Um, and then, you know, then you have auditions. And I always say, like, if I'm consciously casting the person, something's wrong. I say that they cast themselves. The best situation is someone comes, someone comes in, and I'm like, well, that's it. And actually, it's funny you mentioned with um, Nancy Dean with Justine, is because nowadays you're certainly in the first round of auditions, if not callbacks, you're seen via video. You're just not seeing people live. I mean, with her, she was doing the show out of town, so we had to do it that way. But this is interesting that, like, we sent the videos to Bill, and he immediately, of her, was like, yes. Like, that was an immediate. Um, uh, Dorcas, who plays Rhoda, who was in the woods for me here, um, she came in, you didn't know her, and you were like, who is she? Um, uh, but I knew, too, like, her sense of humor is really unique, too, and, um, and when we saw Salome for Lisa, uh, that was, I had, when I, when she, again, it was video, videotape, and I had seen her in New York in 1776, and when I realized that was her, I was like, oh, she's a massive talent, and then she sort of knocked us out. Um, and the last role to cast was Roger, which was um, Daryl, and I had worked with Daryl before, but he, when the pandemic hit, he had gone back to school, he had sort of, I thought, had left the business to some degree. So he never entered my brain, and we, we had not cast it. Um, understandably, Bill and Arthur, that would, they had the most to say about who was gonna play that part, um, which I respected, and, uh, and thank God for social media, because Daryl posted a post that showed him in a show, and I was like, I texted him, I was like, are you performing again? He was like, yes, I'm just being more selective about what I do. I was like, do you know a new brain? He said, yes. Uh, I was like, do you know Sailing? He was like, very well. So I was like, I'm gonna call the casting director. And he sent us a tape the next day, and we were like, oh my God, <laughs> here we are. So, yeah, it's been very exciting. And then finally, before I open up for questions, um, there's some great resources here. We talk about the history of the show, not just, but we have Bill, <coughs> who uh, lives up in Williamstown now. It's available in your access to James, but you also have Mary Testo, who's original. Then also, um, our associate artist Christopher Inbar, who's currently starring in Faith Healer, was the original Roger. So um, what was it like being able to have these resources available to you and not just like, you know, a dusty tome in Lincoln Center Library? I mean, what was interesting, it wasn't practical thing, it was just emotional things. I mean, for Mary, it was very much about her relationship to Bill and the fact that she visited him in the hospital when these real events happened. And it was more emotional for me about like watching her I mean, she even said, like, going through the journey now is in some ways more, um, taught her about going through it in reality. Not taught, but like, it was a different experience reenacting it than actually experiencing it, that the profundity of it. And certainly when we did our designer run in the studio and she was singing the music still plays on and Bill was right in front of her, I'll get emotional. It was so emotional because that, that relationship between the two of them, which, Again, that was the thing that fed me. Um, and obviously Bill, I asked Bill a lot of questions. Um, and it was interesting because Chris um, came to see the final dress and he was so emotional afterwards. I mean, very, very moved by it. And, um, and I mean, there were some questions I asked Mary and Bill and they were like, I don't remember really. And then other things were like, yes, I remember this. Or the great thing too was from Bill and Mary and Chris too, it's like, they, they knew it's a new production. It wasn't about like, oh, this is what we did the first time around. No one ever said that. And I'm appreciative of that, um, very much so. So we're gonna open up for some questions from the audience. So just some uh, guidelines here at Barrington Sage. Uh, we are looking for questions. Uh, we appreciate anything asked about what we're discussing here, not statements or monologuing like I'm doing right now. Um, and also, just want to say that we have three uh, beautiful artists here who are here to talk about their work. And we just always ask Barrett to say that we focus on their work and not on any aspect of their personal lives or their demographics. So, with that, uh, Keeper of the Mike Mora. <laughs> yes. Well, the truth. 
certainly touches on the personal, but you've talked a lot about how you've adapted this show to its current version. What was it like working with what is clearly a live author who still controls the show in terms of the process of adapting, changing, moving, switching? What was it like and how was it to work with Bill? Great. I mean, again, I've, we, the very first show I directed with Bill's was Elegies, which, speaking of scores, I, because I had known Vadim, and I was like, Vadim, we need the score. He's like, it's not finished. I'm like, we literally have the rights and we start rehearsal in the month. So thank God for, luckily it was only on piano, but still, like, the work he had to do in three weeks. Um, and Bill saw that production, I knew he liked my work, and then I, I, the very first summer I was here was the very first summer of the Bill Finn Lab. So we've known each other a long time, he'd asked me to take a look at, to direct a workshop production of another show of his, Romance in Hard Times, and he's always been super generous with me. I mean, super generous. And he really only gave like one note <laughs> about anything, but he was super open. You know, the show means a lot to him, I think, there's probably part of him, in, and I think that the show has not gotten its due. So it was very much about like let's um, let's really give the best production we can have and the truest to who Bill is. And he he was nothing but supportive, nothing but supportive. And James too. Again, James was like, go forth. So. We haven't seen it so yet, but that's coming later in the week, so now I'm real excited about it. So Bill, has he been at these rehearsals? That's what, I'm curious what his reaction to your version. He was there once a week. Um, he always was, at the, and Bill, Bill in terms of Bill's, um, uh, you, know, <laughs> you know Bill likes things when he doesn't say he doesn't like it. But I will say on this show, what was most, like the designer run, um, and sometimes, Bill's a listener, so sometimes you can look at him and his head is down, like listening to the score. Um, but he was watching a lot of it. He applauded a lot. He was crying at times. I then called him that night and said, um, you know, Bill, what do you, I, I talked to him earlier in the process and said, are you happy, Bill? And he said, yes, which is huge for Bill. And I said, you know, Bill, we've known each other a long time. Like, you can tell me if you don't like it, something like, really, you can let me know. And are you sure you're happy? He was like, yes. And then, so after the, desi uh, the designer run, I called him, and he said, I loved it twice, and it's great three times, which I've never heard him say about anything. So I think he's really, really happy. And um, that was huge. So, yeah. We can't say it enough. He's a dog with a bone when he hates something, or when he even, like, kind of doesn't like it. It's like, it's the only thing you'll hear about. I get phone calls like, that's still terrible. You know, it's just, it'll happen constantly, constantly. And then he was just very much in love with this. And I, I yeah, I've never seen him like this kind of happy. Uh, and it looks crazy, because the way he watched the show is he'll close his eyes or he'll hunch over. Like, you know, I've seen lots of shows in the city with him, and it looks like he passes out, and then he wakes up at intermission, he's like, not bad. Uh, <laughs> uh, but that's just, <laughs> so, uh, you know, you, you sit and stare at him while you do the show, and I'm like, what's he thinking? Well, if Bill's unhappy, he will make, he'll let you know during the yes. number. Yes. Like, if Bill's silent, that's a gigantic thumbs up. Yeah. Yes. If Bill applauds, that's like a rave review, because if he doesn't like something, he'll just be like, <laughs> In auditions, like if you're auditioning for him and you hit a bad note, and sitting in the back, He's just instant, <laughs> instant, instant reaction. And I know that when we were going into auditions, he was, I'm not going to say nervous, but he, he took, we talked a lot and he was like, you know, um, we're not going to really cast it. We're not I'm like, Bill, it's going to be an amazing cast, I swear to you. And, um, but again, you know, the, again, I'm, you know, I'm a writer too, and it's such a personal thing to do, but this, beyond that you're putting forth your writing, which is a personal thing to do, but no matter what you're writing about, when it's so personal to his life, I can't imagine what it's like for him to watch it. I mean, I can't imagine, like, yeah. 
because he's always casting himself in all his major shows. It's him in trousers. It's him falsetto. It's, it's him new brain. It's him. And you always have to find someone who's like a genius, who's really irascible, sometimes mean, sometimes egomaniacal, and has the biggest heart in the world. This is an impossible thing to cast, <laughs> and it's all we cast ever <laughs> in his shows. And that's what the, the brilliance about Adam is. I, I love how. His cranky is like good Bill Finn cranky, but then he's just so beautiful and he really makes you feel, and that's the... Like, he is the sweetest. He's the sweetest this guy, guy in the world, too, so... Yeah. Uh, hi. Um, you said you changed the score, you changed the play from Friday to Saturday. I saw Saturdays, and I was sitting next to someone when I was at on Cedar Lane, who saw Fridays, and he said it was very nice. And so I'm curious as to whether what happened and what caused you to make this big change, whatever it was. <laughs> well, there was a big change made from the original to encores, which was to start in the hospital and flashback. Um, and I remember initially calling Vadim and being like, Vadim, when did this happen? This is before I reached out to James. If I'm going to be like, James, talk to me about this opening. But, um, and so we embraced it even more. I'm thinking, okay, let's really try to like hit this over the head. And watching it for two previews, um, I'm like, it just doesn't work. And it's confusing. And I remember saying, like, I was like, it was hard for me for two previews to be like, who, what, half? directed <laughs> this piece. Um, but, you know, if, if one thing I'm proud of is that I, like, well, you know, I feel like I'm bold, and was like, you know what, it just has to change. And, um, you know, I called Adam that night just to let him know it was happening. He was already excited. Um, and then we came in and did it, and it immediately worked. Like, immediately worked. So, we think. <laughs> Uh, so yeah. But you feel it. You feel it in an audience, and like when you're singing an audience, like when you feel like when people lock in, and they're like, okay, I'm on, I'm on the journey with you. And uh, when we had the old version, we didn't feel that until a little deeper into the piece, and now I think people are on board right away. They're like, oh, I understand what I'm watching. And again, Bill's writing, like I would say the piece is most like this, falsettos, a romance in hard times, they're very daring structurally, and very daring how they tell a story. So again, there's a lot of responsibility on a creative team and a cast, which is great, terrifying, and also like, I've, we've got to step up and make it work. Like it's demand your best um, storytelling skills. Especially the it's wonderfully fluid, all the motion. I don't know where the boundary was between director and choreographer. As well. But you have this wonderfully big stage. I'm way back in the mezzanine, and yet you managed to make me feel claustrophobic <laughs> at a key moment. I just can you talk about how you pulled? I mean, that was wonderful. I never felt that before. It was brilliant. Well, it is a very intimate story, and we actually talked about this a lot. It was rather late in the design process that we're like, let's bring it farther downstage yeah. um, so we don't use up upstage. Um, I mean, that has to do with partly scenically of what does it mean to be in the hospital and what does it mean. I mean, part of it is he is trapped in the hospital. He's trapped in the hospital bed often. It was interesting for me to watch it the last few nights of realizing how much, I was like, wow, I keep him in that bed. <laughs> but it was important to me to be like, because of when he literally explodes out of his brain and, and goes someplace else, that we literally then, the stage opens up, um, and we have a wide open campus. I mean, we haven't talked about the designers at all, because the designers are, talk about major storytellers, I mean, this brain in the back um, is a huge piece of the storytelling. Um, uh, Paige Hathaway, who did the set, Deb Svigny, who did 
costumes, Jason Lyons, who did lights, um, and Ken Travis, who did sound. Uh, you know, that's a whole, you could do a whole panel on just that. Uh, because this is a tricky show to do it with. I mean, those are changed, again, even in previews of, of um, towards the end when I say we go most into Gordon's brain, what we call the folly sequence, that took some time to get right to, of like, because there's nothing in the text, <laughs> nothing, that tells you what the, where the hell you are. So we lit it, literally that storytelling is done scenically, initially, of taking us to another world, which then, through staging and Bill's writing, we then, but we needed to be like, we need to take them someplace new and then keep them there so they understand this is a whole new world and a very particular world that we we are in now. And that's a fun bit of the collaboration because we were in our pod for so long, uh, just in the rehearsal room and you're creating a show you know, in a rehearsal room without any, any stuff. And then suddenly all these elements come in and then the collaboration widens and grows and then suddenly I'm reacting to, oh my God, he's wearing that, oh, he needs sing it this way, or da, da, da. and everything kind of changes as you see every other little bit, and the, the, the dances change, and the feelings change, and it was kind of amazing, you know, because I, I couldn't imagine, I know I looked at all the pictures and all the, 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 the mock-ups of things, but I couldn't imagine it until I saw it, and then when you see it, it just changes how you think about everything. And then actually, speaking of good artistic directors, Alan was the one who first brought it up, but towards the end of the sequence, and saying, um, you know, a scenic element, he's like, can that stay in longer? And then it made me think, well, actually, the whole sequence should just be in this one, I say location in quotes, but, um, so that was super helpful, too. Again, it's, it's you know, again, we, we're in the pod, and we're in the pod, even after we get it into previews. And I always know, for me, even sitting in an audience, and that was what we talked about with this opening, you can feel it. And you have new eyes as a creative person because you're like, I'm seeing it the way they're seeing it. And it doesn't work. So, yeah. Well, thank you. Thank you so much for joining us. I want to give a big shout out. I forgot to thank Canyon Ranch, who's the sponsor of our Deeper Look series. If you've not gotten your tickets for this, get your tickets for this. If you saw it on Wednesday or Thursday, come back. <laughs> There's a new opening, there's new moments, the brain does a lot more things now, a lot more things, that's its, that's its own deeper look session back there, is the brain that's hiding upstage. Um, and if you've not seen Faith Healer, it runs for another week. So, but thank you everyone, thank you so much for joining us, thank you panel.